Voucher is a publicly funded coupon that you can use in one place at one time, right? You can only use it for private school tuition. And if you've got a $6,000 voucher, you're going to give that entire coupon to one private school. Tax credit scholarships tend to work the same way, except they're not publicly funded. Uh, the scholarships are coming from private nonprofit scholarship organizations and um, donors to those organizations will get a tax credit. So you've got a, a policy like that in Alabama. Uh, an ESA, uh, all of the ESA policies so far enacted are uh, publicly funded, except for one that's in Missouri, that the funding mechanism is more like a tax credit scholarship. Uh, but the main difference between an ESA and a voucher is uh, that you can use it in a wide variety of, of uh, for a wide variety of educational expenditures, not just for private school tuition, also things like tutoring, textbooks, homeschool curricula, online learning, special needs therapy, uh, and, and more. And you can roll over unused funds from year to year to save for future expenses. So um, just from an economic point of view, there's a few advantages. Uh, first of all, you're not creating a price floor, uh, whereas a voucher, nobody's going to charge less than $6,000 if you've got a $6,000 voucher. But if you have a $6,000 ESA, well, you're not just competing against other private schools. Parents have uh, the ability to spend that in a variety of different places and save for future expenses. So there's downward pressure on price. You're not going to see the same, you're not going to have a price floor and you're not going to see the same sort of tuition inflation that you'd otherwise see. But really more importantly is we're recognizing that it's not just school choice, it's education choice. That education doesn't necessarily have to take place in a brick and mortar building that we call a school. Uh, it can be hybrid homeschooling, it can be blended learning, it can be micro schooling. Uh, there's a wide variety of ways that that families are, are finding um, to best meet the individual learning needs of their children. And it doesn't have to be a school. And, and I would just add that was a, a great comprehensive answer. But, you know, we, we should also favor any um, method that we can to provide families with education freedom and to move away from a near monopoly system of district schooling where we assign kids to a school that happens to be in their neighborhood. And, you know, I think there's a second component of that, which is that we want to be flexible in the types of options that policymakers in the states are considering. While our preference is certainly for a universal ESA at this point, and I would say any state that is thinking about doing a new education choice program from scratch should certainly go with an education savings account. Um, you know, anything to sort of move in the direction of education freedom would be welcome. Um, you don't want to get in a situation where, take, for example, a tax credit, if that is the only thing that you're open to as a state in terms of furthering school choice, because you could be in the enviable position one day of eliminating your income tax in your state, and then you have, you know, no longer have that particular revenue source um, to offset the, the tax credit. So, you know, it's something to keep in mind, I think, that um, depending on what the situation on the ground is in a state, some options might make more sense than others. But if you're starting from scratch, absolutely, or even just expanding existing programs. And that's something else to think about, too, for states, if you have existing programs, converting those, say, a voucher or a tax credit into an education savings account to provide all the flexibility Jason just described. Um, that's really smart policy, too.